Hey everyone, welcome back to our ongoing series. We are looking at the life of Jacob and our series is titled, Jacob, the Faking, Breaking and Making of a Man. This is part four, so hopefully you've been with us on this whole journey. If you haven't, if you've somehow just uh, come upon this uh, video right now and it's part four, go back and watch parts one, two and three because the whole series is gonna make a lot more sense to you if you're following along in sequence. Every one of them, of course, would be a nice standalone presentation, but you'll get so much more if you go through the whole series sequentially. And what we're doing is we're just really studying through the story of Jacob. Today we're gonna to be in Genesis chapter 28. And uh, Genesis chapter 28, our presentation today is titled From Pillow to Pillar. And that's a bit of an unusual title, and it's going to make a lot more sense as the presentation continues, but I'm so glad you guys are here. We had a big presentation. Our, 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 our last week's uh, presentation was big, and it was long, and I'm aware of that. Today's is also going to be dense, but we're covering less material, probably a little less long. But man, this is one of the great stories in Scripture, and not just one of the great stories in Scripture. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most well-known stories in all of ancient literature. I mean, this story has been quoted in poems, it's been quoted in songs, it's been uh, alluded to in movies, it has informed art and paintings and sculpture. So this is not just one of the best known Bible stories, this is a really well-known story. And uh, of, of course here I'm referring to the story of Jacob's ladder and Jacob's vision at a place called Bethel. And uh, there are so many iconic stories and incidents in the life of Jacob, but this is certainly one of the most iconic. So, um, so glad you're joining us. Grab your Bible, grab something to take notes with, and let's get into our presentation titled From Pillow to Pillar. Father in heaven, as we open scripture now, may you open our hearts. May the inspiring spirit be the instructing spirit. And may we come away with a better understanding of who you are, of who we are, and of the world around us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's just pick up exactly where it is that we left off. In fact, these were the last slides from our last presentation. Jacob has been sent off by his parents. He is fleeing now, effectively, for his life, because remember that, that when Esau has learned that his brother has deceitfully acquired the blessing that was, you know, he thought to be his, uh, that was uh, Jacob's plan, or that was, uh, the names are so hard, that was Isaac's plan, and it was Esau's plan, but it was not God's plan. So Esau's frustrated, he's angry, and he's fleeing for his life, and he is sent off, as we'll see here, to a place called Haran. He's going off back to where his mother is from, where Rebekah is from, and this was our last slide. Jacob is not yet a man, much less a godly man. He doesn't know who he is, much less who Yahweh is, but that is about to change. And we talked about the importance of that answer that was given. We're going to come back to it momentarily. In answer to the question, who are you, my son, that Isaac had put to Jacob, he said, I am Esau. Right? I am Esau. So that's a sort of an indication, a marker to us that Jacob is a man who doesn't even know who he is. He doesn't know who Yahweh is, but as we've suggested here, that is about to change. We're in Genesis chapter 28, and we're going to spend basically all of our time in Genesis chapter 28. So let's get into this. Verse 1, uh, let's read verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, So Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padan Aram, to the house of your mother's father Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And that really picks up exactly where we would expect it to pick up. Remember that the last time we were together in Genesis chapter 27, we went into you know, significant detail in that chapter. And we saw that that chapter was framed by Esau's decision to marry not one, but two Hittite women. Now, it's understood by Rebekah and certainly by um, Isaac as well that Jacob's life is in danger here, right? The, the hostility between the brothers has now grown into something that cannot be contained. Rebekah is aware, as is Isaac, that the threat to kill his brother Jacob, Esau's threat to kill his brother Jacob, is, you know, uh, when the days of his father's mourning are past. Well, Isaac is still very much alive, of course, but 
once you've said that kind of a thing, it's a dangerous environment, it's a hostile environment, and the better part of wisdom is to get him out of here, let things cool down a little bit, and Rebecca believes incorrectly that this, you know, this will cool down, you'll go find yourself a wife, it's like going away to college or something. You're going to go away to college, you'll spend a few years there, and then you'll come back. I will summon you when everything is cooled down and you can come back. But as we noted, he will never see the face of his mother again, and I believe that the the pretense of not marrying someone from here, I mean, yeah, they certainly don't want him marrying a Canaanite, but they're, they're saying, oh, go for this reason, which I think is probably sincere, but it's also the, the official excuse or the official way that they're going to send Jacob along because they are, again, afraid for his very life. And uh, don't marry a Canaanite woman. All right, now verses three and four. May God Almighty bless you. Now, this is the actual blessing. It's fascinating about this is that this is now a further blessing and a follow-up blessing to the blessing that had been given back in chapter 27. And this blessing is even more thorough. It's even more biblical. And it's got all of these like creation elements in it and Abrahamic elements in it. I mean, just look at this. Here is the blessing that he gives to his son. Verse three, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase. Increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land. We've talked about land and descendants. There it is right there, where you reside as a foreigner, uh, the land that God gave to Abraham. Now, this has all of this sort of language of both creation and of the Abrahamic covenant really contained in it. And it's important because it shows that now Isaac is resigned to the fact that his stubbornness has been overcome. Again, not in the way that God had hoped or intended, but God works with what we give him. And there is a resignation here, and he is, you know, in a full-throated way endorsing his son here. And he gives him this Abrahamic creational blessing and then sends him on his way. You get, you get the sense here that, that it's the calm after the storm, right? You, you think... Isaac is now resigned to this. Rebecca's pleased as punch. I mean, she's just happy. Now, she doesn't like the fact that her son is going away, and she doesn't know at this point that she will never see him again. But it feels like, oh, everything's well and fine and good. But it doesn't feel that way for Jacob. Jacob doesn't want to leave, and he certainly doesn't want to leave under these circumstances, and he is racked with guilt. All right, verse 5. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. And we're going to have a lot to say in future presentations about Jacob's sojourn in the land of Padan Aram with uh, Bethuel, and, or with Laban, rather, uh, the son of Bethuel. We're going to have a lot more to say about that, and we will get there eventually. But we've got chapter 28 that we've got to deal with here. And we need to make a, a kind of difficult observation, but it's an observation that's true nonetheless, that in seeking to save her son, Jacob, Rebecca lost him because, again, she would never see his face, never again on earth. And this is a tough pill for us to swallow that the overbearing, well-intentioned affection of the mother is actually, and, and a lot, this happens with a lot of parents, this is actually going to create a situation where you've overdone it, you've overplayed your hand, and the separation is very real, and it's not temporary, it's permanent. And there would be many a Christian parent, many a well-meaning parent, who with good intentions have smothered their children, especially their teenage children, but also their younger and older children, just smothered them to the point where they actually create a separation that's so great that in seeking with great anxiety and concern, and again, parental affection to save their children, they actually push their children away and what they see is their children walking off into a, a faraway land and they see their, you know, back silhouetted against the sunset and that's it. And, and I'm speaking here figuratively, but it's also true literally. Sometimes we effectively drive our children away. Now, of course, in a healthy situation, your children should leave and cleave, right? They should go out and find their mates and find their lives and get their jobs and do their things. But I'm talking here specifically spiritually right? Like how many an overbearing but ultimately well-intentioned Christian parent has just been too full-on, too micromanaging, too constraining, and it creates space, 
right? And seeking to save the child, the child is pushed away and ultimately lost. Now, hopefully not eternally lost because they can make the decision to turn, etc. But I want you to feel the force of this story here, that Rebecca's efforts to save and to bless and to help actually had the exact opposite effect. And so then we read, we sort of jump down to verse 10, we read these few words, Jacob set out for Haran. That is to say, he heads to the land of his, his mother's homeland. And I can just imagine on this journey, first of all, it's not a leisurely journey. He's not sauntering there. No, no, he is fleeing for his life. It is entirely possible now that he's leaving and Esau is aware that he's leaving, again, under the pretense, go find a wife, not from around here, that Esau thinks, oh, this is my moment. This is my moment to go out to kill my brother and it not be known that I'm the one that did it. We're, we're going to see in the next story, if we do a series on Joseph, that someone can be killed or nearly killed and then you can drench the garments in the you know, blood of a goat or something and go back. And it's not like there was a police department to investigate this. I mean, this, this is Esau's chance. And Jacob's fear and his being racked with guilt and being sent away hastily all of this would have made for an extremely unpleasant journey. And the headspace that Jacob is in here is one where I just imagine that this conversation is just playing itself out over and over again in his mind. My father, yes, my son, who is it? I am Esau, your firstborn. And, and I just, in my mind's eye, I just see that as he's fleeing in fear, this, this conversation, this fateful, pivotal conversation must have been ringing in his ears. And every time he rehearses and rehashes that conversation, guilt is pressing down hard upon him. I mean, it had all happened so fast, right? I mean, Isaac says, oh, I'm going to bless Esau. And he sends him out seemingly, you know, secretly. But Rebecca catches on to it. Quickly, go bring me, go. It all happened so quickly. And the chain of events is such that now Jacob can hardly believe what's happening here in very short order, probably not hours, more like days, but still. He's now walking hundreds of miles back to the east to try and find a wife. And mom, remember, he's a mama's boy. Mom is in the rearview mirror. Dad is in the rearview mirror. And he's just utterly wrecked with guilt. And, and I can relate to this, and I think we all can. You know, we've made a mistake. We've made a mess of something. We've blundered something. And then what do we do? We further torture ourselves by rehearsing our failures by going over it again and again and again. And we almost feel in some weird way that there's almost a value in torturing ourselves with our failures, with our guilt, with our mistakes. And it just can, in, in worst case scenarios, just lead us down into this deep, dark place where we just feel like, I deserve this. And, and there is a sense in which we do, but this sort of repetitive, torturing ourselves with our mistakes and with our failures leads to a very dark place. And as we're going to see in the story here, Jacob is, is going to end up in a very dark and hard and difficult place, not just literally, but figuratively because he's racked with guilt. He is keenly aware of his failures and mistakes. I mean, it reminds me of, of Psalm 51, one of my, maybe my very favorite Psalm, where David, the writer of the Psalm, in the wake of the great sins that he has committed against Uriah and Bathsheba, he, he, he says this, against you, you only have I sinned and committed this evil in your sight. I, I've made a terrible mistake and God, you see it. I have sinned before you. And that sort of personalization and that, that just going over again and again, you know, we do want to bring our sins and our failures and our, and our guilt to God because it's, where else are we going to go with it, as we'll see here in a moment. In fact, we'll see that right now. That you, you can't really run from guilt, can you? Because everywhere you go, there you are. Right? Like sometimes we think, oh, I just need to change a place. I just need a change of scenery. I need a new location. I need to reinvent myself. And that's true. That's true. There's going to be, in most people's lives, an opportunity to go to a new location, find a new friend group, kind of reinvent yourself. That's true. And there's nothing wrong with that, nothing at all wrong with that, in fact. But, but the idea that you're going to escape your guilt, that you're going to flee from your mistakes, that's a harder thing to do because you know your failures, you know your mistakes, you're rehearsing, as Jacob was, that conversation over and over again in your mind. I am Esau. I am Esau. And I can just imagine 
as we often do. Jacob's just beating himself up, thinking, what was I, what a, what a terrible mistake. I should have said no to my mom. And when he asked me who I was, I, I should have just said, ah, it's Jacob. I mean, he couldn't see. I, I could have still gotten out of it at that moment. I mean, we just rehearse and we catastrophize these mistakes that we make and we find ourselves increasingly isolated and we feel very lonely. And Jacob here is literally lonely. And you're supposed to feel that. Like in the narrative, you're supposed to feel that he's away from his family, he's away from his homeland, he's racked with guilt, and this was not the way. If he was going to leave, there's nothing wrong with going away for a time to college, so to speak, to, you know, to find a spouse, but not under these circumstances. And it's, it's not difficult for us to enter in, you know, emotionally in our imagination into Jacob's headspace because we've all been there. Right? We've all been there. And then we get to verse 11, and, and here's where this iconic story begins. Right? This iconic story of Jacob's ladder and uh, the, the staircase that goes all the way to heaven. We're going to get there momentarily. But I like the language here in verse 11. When he reached a certain place. And let me just pause right there. Every one of us in our life, when we're wrestling with guilt, when we're wrestling with our failures, when we're trying to reinvent ourselves, when we're trying to make a wrong right, we come to a place. It might be a literal place geographically, such as Jacob is coming to here, or we might just come to a place emotionally where we just say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't, I just, you, you come to a place, a place of decision, a place of, of, of pivoting, of changing, of switching. You say, no what, I'm not, I need to come to a place, a new place. Now Jacob of here, Jacob of course here has come to a literal geographical place but it's going to be more than just a place to stop for the night. He's fleeing, I imagine in my mind's eye, at you know, every opportunity, whether he's going through a ravine or over a hilly or, or over a hill or through a valley, he's looking, he's wondering, is Esau tracking me? I mean, Esau's a hunter, right? Even if he tried to make his way circuitous and difficult to track, I mean, Esau's a hunter, and if Esau wants to get him, He's going to get him. Now, as far as we know, Esau is not pursuing him. At least the story gives no indication of that. But th there's no doubt in my mind that Jacob is imagining this, right? It could have actually been the case. But in the same way that when we've made mistakes and we've failed and we've fallen, we catastrophize, we think the worst possible thing is happening. And so Jacob here comes to a certain place. And he stopped for the night because the sun had set. He's exhausted. He's tired. He's afraid. He's lonely. He's racked with guilt. And this is sort of signified by the fact that he takes one of the stones there and he puts it under his head and lays down to sleep. You're supposed to go, blah, 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 blah. wait, what? A stone for a pillow? Exactly. Now remember our presentation is titled From Pillow to Pillar. And here's the pillow part. Here's the pillow part. So just to sort of summarize everything that I've said here, Jacob is in a dark and hard place emotionally and literally. I mean, his head is on a rock pillow. I mean, talk about being in a hard place. You're in a bad way if the softest thing you can find to lay your head on for a sleep or for a rest is a rock. And fear and exhaustion and guilt and regret and loneliness all threaten in this moment to overwhelm him. And again, Ellen White in her book, Patriarchs and Prophets, picks up, I think she's note perfect here, she picks up this sort of emotional, spiritual space that Jacob was in as he headed as he headed for and fled toward Padan Aram. It says, the evening of the second day found him far away from his father's tents. He felt, ah, there's that word, he, he felt, and we all know what it is to feel a certain way about our failures, about our mistakes, about a giant miscalculation, right? We've, we've made a mistake in a relationship. We've said something we shouldn't have said. We've done something we shouldn't have done. We all know what it is to feel estranged, distant, lonely. He felt he was what? An outcast. And he knew, as we always do when we've failed and fallen, he knew that all of this trouble had been brought upon him by his own wrong course. And that's the rub. He feels a certain way because he knows that it's his own course, his own decisions, his own answer, I am Esau, that has brought him to this certain place. But he was so utterly lonely that he felt, here it is again, the need of protection from God as he had never felt it before. She hones in on that word felt here. Well, what does he need protection from? Esau. 
Of course, from Esau and from things that go, you know, uh, you know, in the night. Beasts and robbers and vagabonds and the world is an unsafe place. Especially when your brother has just announced, you know, uh, quite passionately to everyone, I'm going to kill my brother. And so the place is dark. The pillow is hard. The night has come and emotionally you can just feel where he's at. Ellen White continues here with weeping and deep humiliation. He confessed his sin and entreated for some evidence that he was not utterly forsaken. Still, his burdened heart found no relief. I've been there. Have you been there? I've been there. I've been in a place where I've called out to God and I've prayed to God. And I know intellectually, I know biblically and theologically that God answers, but I don't feel relief. Now, sometimes I do. Sometimes God comes through. He gives a revelation. He gives an insight. He gives an assurance. But other times, you're just in such a dark place, such a hard place. Your head is on a rocky pillow. And even then, your heart just doesn't find the relief that it longs for and that it needs. Look at this. He had lost all confidence in himself. Now, that's a good thing. It's actually a really good thing. Doesn't seem like a good thing in this moment, but that's a good thing. He had lost all confidence in himself, and he feared, he's afraid, that the God of his fathers had cast him off, which is just another way of saying he's an outcast. He's a man without a country. He's a man without a home. Here he is sleeping in some you know, nondescript place with his head on a rock, and it just seems like it's any ordinary place, any dark place, any hard place, any terrible place, any lonely place, any depressed place, any discouraged place. We've all been there. But that certain place, that non-place can be transformed into a glorious place if and when God shows up. And I love what Walter Brueggemann does in his Genesis commentary here. And when I read this, I just thought, I've got to include that. That's got to be a part of the series. I love the language here, and I love the way he communicates it. Look at this. Brueggemann writes, A non-place is transformed by the coming of God into a crucial place. Now, now I'm just going to pause right there for a moment. There's nothing special about this place. right? This is just the, the spot in the you know, vast expanse of land between Jacob's homeland and Padan Aram. I mean, this is just as far as he got at the pace that he was moving. This is where exhaustion and discouragement and fatigue finally set in and he just stopped in this place. If he'd gone another mile or two miles further, it would have been that place. So, so this is the point, it's, it's a non-place. It's, it's not that he arrived at some sacred location, some portal between heaven and earth. No, it's just a non-place. And Brueggemann, I like his language there, a non-place. This non-place is transformed by the coming of God into a crucial place. This transformation takes place during sleep, and I like this too, when Jacob has lost control of his destiny. Rather than trying to trick his brother over the soup or try to pretend that he's Esau, when you're asleep, and there are senses in which we can have what's called lucid dreaming and we can control to some degree the outcome of our dreams or the direction of our dreams. But I like what Brueggemann does here. He says, in, in sleep, he can't determine his own destiny. He's lost control of his destiny. He will not resist, and I really like this, the other one, capital O, capital O. He won't be resisting God and God's overtures to him in the night. And in the process, this non-person, i.e. exiled, threatened, outcast, lonely, discouraged, whatever, is transformed by the coming of God into a person crucial for the promise. Brueggemann is exactly correct here to center Jacob as the, the person in whom God will, he will become a repository for the Abrahamic promise. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this has not happened in the way that God had hoped or intended. But nevertheless, the blessing has been given, the birthright has been secured, and this non-place is about ready to be transformed into the very gate of heaven, and this non-person, right, this person that feels like an outcast, he feels like a failure, he feels like he's, he's afraid of dying, he's gonna, he feels like he's going to die, right, crushed by the weight of his own guilt, if not, you know, run through with a, with a spear by his own brother Esau. He's just, he's a non-person, but he becomes the very repository of the promise. And I love what Brueggemann does there. A non-place into a place and a non-person into the very repository of the Abrahamic promise. So let's say this, 
God's presence not only changes the place, it changes the person. God's presence changes the place and the person. By the way, the word for this is holy. Holy. The word holy, from, usually from the Hebrew word Kadesh in the Old Testament, means different, unusual, atypical, even weird. Right? And so, so when God, for example, appears to Moses at the burning bush, and he says, he says you're on holy ground, well, that bush was a non-bush. Right? It, it, was, it wasn't, a, or I should say, a non-place or a non-bush. It, was, it, was it, it wasn't the bush that was important. It was God's presence that was important. And God's presence made that place a place where the ground was holy. And that not only changed the location, it changed Moses. Because this is where Moses receives the, the promise. This is where Moses receives the commission. Go and tell Pharaoh to let my children go. This, this changes the whole trajectory of Moses' life in the same way. This non-place is about ready to be transformed into a place. By what? Because the place is special? No, because God is going to show up here in an incredible way. But not only is the place going to be changed from some random location, from some random stop between where his homeland and Padan Aram, but Jacob himself is going to be transformed. Jacob himself is going to have an encounter with Yahweh. Because he doesn't know who he is and he doesn't know who Yahweh is, but he's about ready to find out. And here it is. In this state, this dreamlike state, he has a vision. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway, and this is what's crucial resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. Now, different translations render this differently. Some say a stairway, some say a ladder, some say uh, a, a ramp, right? But, but, and, and it was probably like a terrace, actually. I did a little bit of research on the actual word itself. It was probably something like a, you know, a series of terraces that started down on the earth and just went up and up and up and up and up all the way to the top. It was all the way down to the earth, and this is crucial, with its top that reached out of sight into the heavens, you know, past the vanishing point. You could just see it and see it, and then you just couldn't see it anymore, but you could tell it kept going up. And he saw something remarkable. The angels of God, these divine supernatural beings, were, were moving up and down, ascending and descending on this ramp, on this staircase, on this ladder is probably not the best translation. We talk about Jacob's ladder. It was more of a staircase or a ramp that went up. Now, at, at its that's the vision. That's it. That's the vision there. And at its most sort of basic, rudimentary, like if you just cook the vision down, the vision is basically announcing this. Earth and heaven are connected. Right? That there's, a, that there's not, that heaven's not over there and earth is down here and there is no connection. There is no way between them. No, at, at its most basic level, what the staircase announces, what the, what the ramp announces is that earth and heaven are fundamentally connected. Back to Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets. But God did not forsake Jacob. Amen. He felt that way. He felt discouraged. He felt like an outcast. He felt afraid. But God did not forsake Jacob. And we just have to feel that here for a moment. We have to feel that even when we feel a certain way, even when our heart and our emotions and our emotional psychological landscape is telling us that a certain thing is true. That doesn't mean it's true. I, just very quickly to remind ourselves of the experience of Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. After they had eaten of the tree, they felt that having the posture of being afraid of God was the right posture. God comes down into the garden in the cool of the day and they flee from God. Why are they fleeing from God? Because they don't know who God is. They are not fleeing from who God actually is because God has come down into the garden with good intent, actually, to announce the gospel, in fact, and to tell them that this is going to be fixed, that, that this can be fixed, that there is a way out. But what they actually do is they assume incorrectly that their internal feelings of guilt and shame are an accurate reflection of God's attitude and posture toward them, and so they're fleeing. But crucially, they're not fleeing from who God is but from whom they incorrectly imagine him to be, so too with us, so too with Jacob. When we feel that we are estranged from God, that we are outcast from God, that we are, that, no, no, that's not actually the case. That's our own voice of guilt and the internal voice of conscience, of conscience, our own 
keen sense of our failures and our faults and our mistakes, telling us you're, out, you're an outcast, you're estranged, you're forsaken. But that's not true. It's absolutely not true. And we need to say no to how we feel and yes to what Scripture says. We're going to get to that in just a second. But God did not forsake Jacob. His mercy was still extended to his erring, distrustful servant. The Lord compassionately revealed just what Jacob needed. Hallelujah! A Savior! He had sinned, yes, but his heart was filled with gratitude as he saw revealed a way. And there it is. I underlined it for you so you can't miss it. A way by which he could be restored to the favor of God. That's what that staircase represents. A way. And Ellen White just says it unambiguously here and unadornedly. The world is not left in solitary hopelessness. Hallelujah. And not just the world. You, me. Like, how about this? David is not left in solitary hopelessness. You are not left in solitary hopelessness. Say it out loud. I am not left in solitary hopelessness. Have you failed? Have you made a mistake? Have you made a mess of it? Did you do the wrong thing? Did you say the wrong thing? Did you think the wrong thing? Yes, yes, and yes, in any given circumstance. That's entirely possible, likely. But you are not left in solitary hopelessness. And then this, the latter represents Jesus. The ladder represents Jesus. That ramp, that staircase, that she calls ladder here, represents Jesus. Earth and heaven are connected. The appointed medium of communication. Had he not with his own merits bridged the gulf that sin had made, the gulf, right, the chasm, the abyss that seemingly separates heaven and earth, the ministering angels could, not have, could have held no communion with fallen man. Christ connects. Christ connects man in his weakness and helplessness with the source of infinite power. There it is. Christ connects. And this is exactly, of course, what Jesus referred to in John chapter 1, fast forwarding to the New Testament, John chapter 1. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Verse 50, Jesus said, Yet you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater stuff than this, man. You're impressed by that. You're going to see a lot more than this. Then verse 51, he then added, I'm telling you the truth. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is Jesus saying what Ellen White just said expressly. That ladder, Jacob's ladder, Jacob's ramp, Jacob's staircase represents Jesus, the connection, the way between heaven and earth. And so we've already said, at its most basic, we just cook the vision down to its, you know, basic, most basic lesson, its most basic point. It's that earth and heaven are connected, but let's add this now, by Jesus. Earth and heaven are connected by Jesus. And we quote Brueggemann again, all right, this is just too good to leave out. The meeting happens in a dream. The wakeful world of Jacob was a world of fear and of terror and of loneliness. And we may imagine, writes Brueggemann, unresolved guilt. Of course. What is your name? Who are you? I am Esau. And so Brueggemann is note perfect here. Fear, terror, loneliness, unresolved guilt. The dream, and I love this language. The dream permits the entry of an alternative into his life. An alternative into his life. The dream is not a morbid review of a shameful past. It is rather a presentation of an alternative future with God. The gospel moves to Jacob in a time when his guard is down. Oh, feel that, friends. Feel that right now. The gospel, notice, Jacob doesn't move to the gospel. The gospel moves to Jacob in a time when his guard is down. And don't miss the punchline here. The vision is not a review of you know, some itemized catalog of his failures. It's not a vision that primarily looks back. It looks forward. In fact, look what I've got here on the screen, just so you can really rivet it in your mind. When it comes to our sins and our failures, God orients us more to the future than to the past because what lies ahead supersedes our past missteps. I mean, this is incredible. It's absolutely incredible that when he is discouraged and he's alone and he feels like an outcast and he's racked with guilt, God doesn't show up and say, man, you blew it. You made a giant mistake. What were you thinking? How could you possibly? No, no, he doesn't say, let's go over in itemized fashion. You know, the catalog of your mistakes, the catalog of your failures. In fact, he doesn't point backward at all. He points 
He really doesn't even point forward. He points upward. Oh, friends, feel this. Feel this, that in his darkest, hardest, most difficult and discouraging and trying moment, God doesn't point him back to his failures and mistakes, to his past that he is keenly aware was a giant mistake and failure. He points him forward, but mostly upward. He points him upward. I mean, this has got Jeremiah 29, 11 written all over it. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future forward and a hope upward. A future and a hope. Oh, it's amazing. And I could point you literally to story after story after story, but we don't need to go to other stories because this story makes the point. But I could point you to story after story where God arrives at somebody. I mean, we've already mentioned the Garden of Eden there. God points them forward to the promise of a deliverer with Adam and Eve. And here he points Jacob forward through the ladder, through the ramp. And so the language is unambiguous. The ladder is Jesus. Back to Brueggemann. The ladder is a visual vehicle for a gospel assertion. It goes forward and up. Friends, say it right now. Say it out loud to yourself. I'm going forward and up. I don't know what's in your past. I know what's in my past. I know my failures. I know my mistakes. I know my missteps. I know my dysfunctions. But God doesn't turn me around and uh, like a dog returning to its vomit. It doesn't he doesn't make me look back and, and have great uh, uh, awareness of my past. I know my past. I don't need God you know, to rub my nose in it. This is what Psalm 51 is all about. What God does is he turns us this way. He gives us a future and a hope, forward and upward. And the point that Brueggemann makes here is exactly correct. The, the, the ladder, the ramp, is a vehicle for a gospel assertion that the gospel has moved toward Jacob. Earth is not left to its own resources and heaven is not a remote self-contained realm for the gods. And I love this. Brueggemann is, is very concise in his writing style. Heaven has to do with earth. Heaven has to do with earth. I mean, that's it. That's the point. But in Jacob's encounter with Yahweh, it's really made up of two parts. When you read it there in Genesis 28, it's made up of two parts. The vision is what Jacob saw. But there was also the promise, and this is actually by far the, the larger part of the revelation. What he saw is just a very short little bit. He saw a ladder reaching from the ground up to the heavens, and angels were going up and down on it. I mean, what he actually saw was quite small in the revelation. It was important. It was not insignificant. But in terms of the actual you know, amount of, of, of language and, and, and real estate, textual real estate that's given to it, it's, it's quite small. But what takes up even more textual real estate is what he heard. And what he heard, the sort of narration to the vision, is incredible. Look at this. Genesis 28, verses 13 and 14. And above it, that is to say, above the ramp, the ladder, stood Yahweh, this God that he does not know. And he said, I am Yahweh, God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. Okay, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting very proximate to that Abrahamic promise, that Abrahamic blessing. I will give you and your descendants the land. We've noted this again and again, land and descendants, land and descendants. A goodly land inhabited by a godly people was God's original creational intent, and God has never moved away from that creational intent. In fact, that's why when you go, fast forward all the way to the end of Scripture, Fast forward all the way down to the book of Revelation. What do you have? A new heaven and a new earth that's occupied by a godly people in whose foreheads are written the name of God. What is that? That's a goodly land. A new heavens and a new earth inhabited by what? A godly people. God's intent has never changed. The, the old Hebrews used to say that their vision of paradise, their vision of heaven was every man, every woman under their own fig tree. Right, your own little patch, your own little piece of real estate. A goodly, productive, fertile, flourishing land inhabited by a godly people. And that's what he says here. I will give your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. If you're at all familiar with the Abrahamic promise in, in Genesis 12 and Genesis, it's reiterated in Genesis 15, 16, 17, 18 and beyond. If this is the same language. It's like the identical language. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. This is a 
almost verbatim, well, in some cases, it is a verbatim sort of compressed, summarized version of the Abrahamic promise. I mean, this is incredible. At his darkest moment, when, when he feels most estranged from his homeland, most estranged from his family, and most importantly, most estranged from God, whatever God is, racked with guilt and fear and struggling, God shows up and tells him that he's an heir and inheritor of the most important promise in his family, in his lineage, and this promise that's significant and influential for the whole world, all peoples on earth will be blessed through this promise, through him. That was the very Abrahamic promise. And then this, whoo, then this, verse 15, I am with you. Feel that. Feel that. In that moment, in your imagination, go back to Jacob in that dark place, in that hard place, in that place of profound discouragement and estrangement. And God says to him, as he sees the ladder that connects earth and heaven, I am with you. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back. It's going to be okay. Stop looking over your shoulder about Esau. I've got this. And I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Now, just look at this. I mean, this is what God says in, in verses 13 to 15. I will give, I will give the land and the, the descendants to you. I'm going to do that. You and your descendants, we're going to get this land. I am with you. I will watch over you. Or some translations, I will keep you. I will preserve you. I will bring you back. I will not leave you. And you can have confidence in all of this because I have promised. This has got the story of Abraham all over it. It's got the gospel all over it, right? It's got the I will never leave you nor forsake you vibe. Wow, I just want you to feel this. Let this wash over you. Let this infiltrate every corner of your mind and of your thinking. Just feel that this is the, the, the God that makes these kinds of promises when you're at your lowest moment, when you feel the most discouraged, the most estranged, the most cut off, the most guilty. God shows up in that moment, gives you a grand and beautiful vision and dream and says, I'm not going to leave you. I will be with you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to make you a bunch of promises. Whoo! Feel that. Brueggemann summarizes all of this by saying, Basically, thus, accompaniment, protection, and homecoming, what he calls a full complement of good news. What's good news? The gospel. And that really is the gospel, those three words. Accompaniment, I will be with you. Protection, I will keep you. Homecoming, I will bring you to myself. I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you. Right? This is what Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Accompaniment, protection, homecoming, a full complement of good news. And don't miss this. The announcement is not made when he's at his best, when he's at his most well-behaved, when he's doing everything in exactly, you know, the upright Remember our Hebrew word, Tom, his, the perfect way? That, that's not when the announcement is made. The announcement is made when he's in a dark, lonely, fearful place, and his head is on a pillow. Come on now. Feel that. Yahweh's blessing of Jacob recalls Isaac's earlier blessing, and also, as Isaac's blessing had, which we just saw earlier in the chapter, draws on creation and the Abrahamic covenant, and this is a cool point. Don't miss this. Thus, Isaac was prophetic when blessing Jacob according to God's radical word to Rebekah. Now, I just can't, I can't run over this without noting the point of what might have been, what could have been, or what should have been. If Isaac would have submitted himself to the word of Rebekah, if even though he was blind, literally, he would not have been blind spiritually, if he would have listened to his wife, is basically what I'm saying here, then he would have known that, that this was God's intent all along. And God, in his own way, would have worked it out. He could have pushed back against unjust primogeniture, and he could have pushed back against unaccountable patriarchalism. Now, look at this. Isaac was prophetic when blessing Jacob, according to God's radical word, the overturning of conventional wisdom to Rebekah. But he was thwarted when he attempted to bless Esau in the same way, contrary to God's radical word to Rebecca. It's fascinating. It's absolutely 
amazing and fascinating here. All right, verses 16 and 17. When Jacob, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely Yahweh was in this place, this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Okay, so this is the place. He, he thinks incorrectly, mistakenly, that, that something's really, well, lucky me. How fortuitous. I just, I ended up in exactly the right place. No, 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 no. It's not that this place was special. It's that Yahweh's special and the whole earth is his. And if you would have stopped a mile back or if you would have gone a mile further, that would have been the place because Yahweh is the one that changes not only the place, but he changes the person. It's not just that you fortuitously landed in some holy shrine, some portal between heaven and earth. No, 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 no. The ladder right here on the screen, the ladder which came from heaven down, all the way down to the earth, watch this, in the sort of larger story of the book of Genesis, is actually the reverse of the Tower of Babel. Now, what? You say, blah, 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 where'd that come from? Well, think about it. The Tower of Babel was erected from the earth up, right? And it didn't even reach the gate of heaven. That was the attempt. That was the desire. We'll build a tower that will reach into the heavens. But where Babel would go from the earth up under the power of man, watch this, the ladder, the staircase, the ramp of Jacob, of Jesus really, but it's revealed to Jacob, comes from heaven down. And, and the crucial point here that has to be made is that it goes from all the way from heaven all the way down. There's no gap. There's no synapse where we have to jump up and grab. No, that's not what's happening here. All the way up all the way down, but not from, not from down to up, but from up to down. Oh, this, like I said to you, the story of Jacob has the gospel all over it. I mean, this, this always reminds me of one of my favorite passages and one of my favorite stories in the New Testament, the story of Zacchaeus, Luke chapter 19, verse five. When Jesus came to the place, well, where was the place? Well, in that instance, it was a sycamore tree, right? Zacchaeus, the you know, estranged, outcast tax collector had climbed up in, I've preached a lot of sermons on this over the years, had climbed up into the sycamore tree. And when Jesus showed up there, an ordinary sycamore tree, just as with the burning bush with Moses, became the place. Jacob didn't arrive at some special place. He just arrived at any non-place, as Brueggemann calls it. And when God shows up, that becomes the place. Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Jesus makes the place. And without him, any place is a non-place. But with him, any place is the place. All right, here we go. Let's wrap this story up. Verses 18 and 19, early the next morning, right? This is after the incredible vision and not just the vision, but the promise. So it's both, you know, visual and auditory. Jacob took the very stone. Oh, this is too good. This is too good. Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it as a, as a symbol of, of anointing and of dedication as a ceremonial act. And he called the name of that place Bethel and the city used to be the, the very, the house of God, the gate of God from pillow to pillar. And don't miss that. Don't miss that. This is too good to miss. The rock of hardship and pain, that stony pillow, has now become the cornerstone of holiness and of praise. The pillow becomes the pillar. And I want you to feel that right now in your bones, in your heart of hearts. That our darkest and hardest and most difficult places, our places of addiction, our places of failure, our places of, of having made a mess of it, our places of dysfunction, those places can become the cornerstone of praise. We can build a pillar on those failures because God shows up and he transforms any old place into the place. And he transforms any old non-person into a person central to his promise, to his purposes, and to his covenant. The pillow, the pillow of hardship becomes the pillar of praise. Feel that. The, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your struggles are, your failures, your weaknesses, your mistakes, your addictions. But those things, those, those things that are like anchors pulling us down into the darkness, into the depths of our own despair. No, 
God can transform us and he can transform them such that the hard thing, when we get the victory, when we overcome, when we leave the addiction behind, these things now become the very, the very foundation of a new life, a new man, a new name, a new way, a new land. And that's what you're supposed to feel here. Jacob is not only moving geographically, he's moving spiritually and emotionally. The faking, breaking, and making of a man, he's being transformed. Has he failed? Yes. Has he made mistakes? Yes. Is he discouraged? Yes. Was he lonely? Yes. But God is transforming him. And as we're going to see, in case we're tempted to think that, oh, everything's going to be fine now. It's all good now. For the, no, it's actually not. And that's one of the great things about the story of Jacob is that even though he's been given these promises, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will stay with you. He's going to go on. He's going to make additional mistakes. His life is going to be harder still going forward. Anyway, we've got a lot to talk about. There's just so much to talk about in this, but I, I, I love that language from pillow to pillar, from pillow to pillar. Then, you know, Jacob as an act of worship and as a promise to this God, Yahweh, the God of his father and his grandfather, Jacob made a vow and he said, if, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey that I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then Yahweh will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you have, of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And this is the sort of inauguration of the tithing principle, the tenth principle. And we're not gonna spend any time on that except to say that it's actually kind of funny to me. It's, it's actually a little humorous. You know, God has just showed up in your darkest moment, in your most difficult place, and, and he's given you a vision, and he's given you a promise, and the resumption of, of the Abrahamic, you know, covenant. <laughs> it's funny, and Jacob's response is, you know what, God, you're so awesome, you're so amazing, and even here it's conditional. If you do what you say you will do, then I will give you 10%. <laughs> it's funny. It's actually funny to me. It sounds funny to say it out loud, right? Like he should be saying something like, I will give you everything. All that I have is yours. And of course, that's the point. The 10% is a symbol that everything belongs to God, right? But it, 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 you have to see the humor in this, right? Like, oh God, you've rescued me from the darkest night. You've, you've delivered me. You've promised. You've given me a forward and upward look. 10%. I mean, it sounds shameful. It sounds funny. It sounds goofy, 10%. But the point here is this, and just a quick word, now that we've said a little bit about tithe, I'm not going to say more about that, except that the tithing principle is still in effect, which is that everything that we have is God's, our talent is God's, our money is God's, our resources are God's, our skills are God's. So when we give the 10% plus, 10% is a minimum, that's just saying, God, everything's yours. Okay, but I want to say this, and this is crucially important. We can see from this passage that Jacob is not yet a monotheist, right? He's not like, as his descendants will later be, the Jewish people, they will have the commands given to them on Sinai summit, written by the finger of God. I am the Lord, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. There are no other gods. And that emergent monotheism will become the salient feature of Judaism. But we're not there yet. Remember, we have to read the Bible forward before we read it backward. At this point, what he's saying is, of all of the various deities that could have been Jacob's deity, because now he's going to a new land, and a new land and a new place, as we will see, will have new deities. Laban has his own deities, his own God, that, or God or gods that he worships. And so what he's saying is, if you do, you've given me this vision, you've given me this promise, you're the God of my father and of my grandfather. If you do what you say you will do, then you'll be my God. Then you will be my God. And here again, so beautiful, God is going to, God meets us where we're at. He takes us where we're at with all of our follies, with all of our promises of 10%, our lame, humorous promises of 10%. God's like, I, I can work with that. You bring me a few loaves and fishes, I can work with that. Right? Don't feel like in that moment of transformation, and we'll see this in Jacob's life going forward, he's not just going you know, to hit home runs from here on out. But don't feel like in that moment of transformation, you have to now suddenly have your act together and everything's going great. We will see that that is not the case with Jacob. This transformation from the faking, breaking, and making of a man is not something that happens only in a moment. It's happening incrementally, sequentially, but it is happening. And it's happening in my life, and it's happening in your life. Let's do our review. 
All right, very quickly, number one, God longs to bless. He desires our flourishing and our fruitfulness, right? We see that in both the blessing that God gave, that God gave to Jacob and that Isaac gave to Jacob. You know, that you would be a blessing and that you would be fruitful. And that promise of a, of a goodly land inhabited by a godly people was the original, not only the Abrahamic promise, but it was the Edenic promise. That was God's creational intent. And we see it as we fast forward to the book of Revelation. That's where we're going. That's where we're going. A new heaven and a new earth inhabited by a godly people. And oh Lord, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. I mean, if a guy like Jacob can get in, as we're going to see, I can get in. And you can get in. Because we don't get in by jumping up to grab the ladder. The ladder comes all the way down to us. Even people like you and me. All right. You can't outrun your guilt. We've said that. We'll say it again. Because everywhere you go, there you are. Okay. You know how you resolve guilt? You meet Jesus. You encounter Jesus. You give it to Jesus. You see that the ladder goes all the way up and all the way down. You can't flee from guilt. Because everywhere you go, lo and behold, there you are. God's presence makes the difference, right? It wasn't that the place was significant. It's that God is significant. God transforms not only the place, he transforms the person. And that's what you and I fundamentally need. We don't just need a relocation. We need a transformation of our heart. And that transformation can only happen when we realize that God is just that good. God is just that awesome. God is just that beautiful. His promises are just that secure. I will be with you. I will take care of you. I will keep you. I will bring you back. I have promised. That's the difference. And we've already said several times, but let's just remind ourselves, the ladder goes all the way up and all the way down. All the way up and all the way down. This is, by the way, why the Hebrews, in the building of their, their altar, when God gave in Exodus chapter 20, something he calls the law of the altar, they were not supposed to put their altar with steps. There was no, there was no steps climbing up because you don't, climb up to God, God comes down to us. And that's the point of the ladder, the ramp, all the way up, all the way down. And Jesus, remember, said in John chapter 1, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the ladder. He was God, he is God, and he came and became a human being. All the way up, all the way down. Not up, not down to up like the Tower of Babel, but up to down. That's Jesus. All right, with God, your future is greater than your past, right? That's the promise of Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. It's the promise of all of scripture. I have given you a hope and a future. God does not primarily orient us backward to the long, dark catalog of our failures, mistakes, and sins and rebellion. He points us forward when we come to him and he says, forward and upward. That's the latter, forward and upward. God's promises are sturdy and enduring. This is why we continue to see the recapitulation of the Abrahamic promise. We just can't get away from it. We can't get away from it. We can't get away from it. Land and descendants, land and descendants, land and descendants, a godly people inhabiting a goodly land. Accompaniment, protection, and homecoming, a full complement, as Brueggemann said, of good news. Exactly. That's the gospel. I will be with you, I will keep you, and I'm going to bring you home. I'm going to bring you to myself. And then, as our title suggests, the big punchline here is, our pillows of hardship and difficulty and darkness and fear and despair can become, and pain, can become those pillars of holiness and of praise. And God can transform our addictions. He can transform our failures when we turn to him and say, yes to, yes to Yahweh, yes to Jesus. And he says, you are no, well, we'll get to there a little bit later. He transforms us. He transforms the place. And again, as we will see, this transformation in Jacob's life is not a moment. It's not one off. It's an ongoing growth, an ongoing transformation as Jacob becomes the man that God had called him to be. And we should expect the same in our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a story. What a story. What a vision. What a revelation. We are so thrilled beyond thrilled, beyond thankful. Father, our whole being goes out and prays to you that the ladder goes all the way up, the ramp, the staircase goes all the way up and all the way down. And Father, we need it to come all the way down because we have some dark places, we have some hard places, we have some failures, some addictions, some faults, some mistakes. We've made a mess, Lord, and our head is on a rocky pillow. Father, I pray that in my life and in the lives of those that are listening that you would turn that rocky pillow into a pillar of praise, a pillar of thanksgiving, 
and a pillar that reminds us of your promise of a hope and a future, forward and upward, not to Jesus, but with Jesus and through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.